with uh, Half-Life 2, then um, we reach a lot of developers who may be thinking of how to structure their games. And with Half-Life 2, you decided to go with the episode um, model. Can you give us any kind of insight as to why you did that? Um, there's always this uh, constant, you know, we're always kind of gnawing on this issue of, you know, how, how are we supposed to be creating value uh, for, for our customers? And uh, the nice thing about Half-Life 1 and Half-Life 2 were, you know, you could use this fairly straightforward model, which was think of them like a movie, right? Think of them as like a big, you know, periodic giant blast of stuff. Uh, and then multiplayers, you can think of them maybe not so much as a film, but more like a sport, right? The rules and how value is created look a lot more like sports. Somebody can't come along and say, hey, I took your baseball and I changed a couple rules, and everybody's going to switch. Much more of the value of the experience is embedded in the community that exists around it. Um, we had become worried in sort of the Half-Life 2 time frame, you know, especially since it had taken us, you know, I don't know, 20, 30 years to actually ship uh, the game that uh, we weren't doing a good job um, managing sort of the, the risk reward for, for our customers. You know, and that's what led to thinking about uh, episodic content of trying to come up with uh, a better uh, way of delivering uh, value to our customers. Um, Steam was certainly, a, you know, one part of how we were trying to think about opportunities for, for value creation. Um, you know, if you fast forward today, the thing we're struggling with a lot is the role of customers in content creation and sort of how the partnership between customers and, and groups of game creators is, is going to change. Uh, we see more and more that um, rather than thinking, you know, rather than saying you've got a, a game and then you have customers of the game, you know, and that they're, you know, you can sort of imagine at one end of the spectrum, there's the auteur model where even taking the director's vision and putting it onto a piece of film is a violation of the underlying vision, all the way to the other thing where you say, well, actually, there's just a sea of people who are contributing to the overall entertainment experience. And, you know, the role of a developer is almost to create a skeleton or a framework, which, you know, is optimal for everybody participating and creating value in that space. And it gets even weirder when people in one space are creating values in what has previously been a disconnected space. So for example, or to, to translate that into gaming terms really concretely, it's that you know my mount in Skyrim is my courier in Dota 2. Now that's a really sort of narrow definition of the kind of entertainment experience you could have. But it leads to thinking about things like, wow, Dendi is a super entertaining player. He's a professional gamer. And how can we make him more productive? How can he cre you know, use the fact that just him playing is an entertainment experience, right? I'll sit and watch Dendi play for hours. And so if he's contributing value to this you know, entertainment collective, you know, how can we be making sure that he can be doing more of that rather than you know, having to you know, go work at his, I don't know uh, what, I actually, Dendi's Russian, so I don't actually know what, you know, what, what the equivalent of working, well, I used to work at, um, before I joined Microsoft, I worked at a German gymnasium as a towel boy, so whatever the logical equivalent is, if you're Dendi, <laughs> what, but what we'd rather he did is he would play, so how do you share, do advertising revenue, how can he sign autographs and after the international, you know, throw his sword into the crowd, you know, so that somebody out of, out of his fans, one of them actually gets the real sword that he was using when he was, you know, competing, so that's the kind of thing that we're thinking about now. So, but that process of going like, hooray, let's not make just another garden variety shoot or two. How do we knit together this platform for digital goods and services, which encompasses user generated content and productivity software, as well as these previously disconnected islands of, of single player and multiplayer content. You know, that's just this ongoing process that we go through. Um, you know, I'm sure that 10 years from now, the, the issues that you know, today strike us as being 
sort of very interesting and cutting edge, you know, some of them will be perceived as re as relevant. Some of them will be perceived as, wow, that was a really stupid way of trying to think about this other completely different problem. And I'm sure we'll have a new set of issues that are confronting us there. So the one thing I would say, if people are trying to understand is like, this is this ongoing thing. And if anything, the rate of change appears to be increasing, right? The things which previously were really stable are becoming less so whether it's on the hardware side, whether it's on the relationships between creators and consumers, whether it's the relationship between different uh, islands of intellectual property or whatever, all of this seems to be much more uh, in play uh, than I would have thought it would have been uh, if I were you know, looking 10 years into the future, 10 years ago. It also brings up some interesting legal questions because our current legal processes and agree agreements and so on are very ill-suited to what we think the future looks like, right? And so I think what we need is sort of a lot of cooperation between developers and not sort of uh, antagonistic and confrontational approaches because we don't really know what the right form for these kinds of collaborations. Like, hey, you know, the, the right thing to do, given what we understand, is for our content to fluidly and appropriately move into your game. So what does that mean? Like who makes money and how do we how do rights work? And what happens if somebody mashes this stuff stuff all up together? And you know, I, I'm not saying that everything that everybody's gonna do is gonna be appropriate and legitimate, but I am sort of saying you know, we certainly feel that we have to explore this, that the, the you know, your first reaction shouldn't be to say, you know, no, you can't possibly uh, do that. Uh, uh, that's wrong. We should, you know, send you uh, uh, a DMCA takedown notice or whatever. It's like to think pretty hard about uh, what, what the emerging structures are going to be. Right. And in the same way that organizations can strangle you when new, new problems come along, I'm a little bit worried that, you know, the legal frameworks that are in place uh, are not necessarily the legal, the optimal legal f frameworks for where we're going to be. And we just need to be careful to, to not sort of strangle the opportunity our industry has uh, simply because it doesn't look like uh, the industry that we used to be.